is this the age of amazement? What does that mean? And I speak as a person who is just a consumer like you. What does it constitute when you say an age of amazement? What are the things that need to be amazing to the, for the age to be amazing? What do you need to own to say that your life is amazing? How long do you need to live? What kind of food should you eat? If you weren't getting food, getting food. If you were getting food, getting it easier and more variety. How much money do you need? How should you feel? That we need to figure that out before we say this age is amazing or not. In the past, a lot of people had massive houses. Like this one, a grand lakefront home in upstate New York. Isn't this amazing? But if you like clothes, this is the only cupboard they had. In 1800, even the rich could afford very few things in terms of clothes. There was no Amazon Prime with same-day delivery. There was no ready-made clothes. So if your amazing life is having a big house, you had it in 1800, but you wouldn't get Chinese food, you couldn't watch a movie, and you know, this was the cupboard that you had. Most people travel rarely. You know, the many of you have traveled some distance to come to IMI. 100 years ago, most of your forefathers hadn't traveled that much distance in their lives. To carry post, there were runners. There was no email, no WhatsApp. Enjoyed rudimentary entertainment. Usually when the, in Bengal, the Jomidar would have a play they would come to see. That was the only form of entertainment. Unlike my daughter, my forefather couldn't say, Alexa, play Despacito, and something would start playing. You know, that is, in that sense, is this an amazing life? How did we get where we are today? When you look at the over 200 years, what made us be where we are today? It is by looking at that and evaluating that, we can say whether we are amazing and where we need to be to be more amazing. You know, there's this book called Sapiens. Anyone who's read it? Talks about wise men. You know, it's a very, not, not a particularly modest name that we have given ourselves, the wise men, are said to have unique gift to socialize to achieve improbable tasks, which means that there were, in our species, our cousins, Neanderthals, had bigger brains than us. There are other features which might be taught in business school, leadership, resource mobilization, which other animals have more of. Hard work, you know, other animals have more of. But, you know, I have to say this because I'm an IMI, but management or imagination are things that separate the Homo sapiens to every other species. That's why we can combine together and build pyramids, go to space, form laws, you know, think of music, create institutions, imagine and feel patriotism. All of these things can help us gel together and do remarkable things. I thought the easiest way to talk about this would be get into my own life and see how even simple products that you use, you never think much about walking over the carpet that you just walked over to come to this place, or the tea that you drink. So I'll give examples of, from my world, the world of luxury carpets. This is an initiative that OBT is doing, my company called Proud to be Indian, which basically combines the best of Indian design, making the best luxury carpets. Does this initiative start with them? Does it start with us, Tarun Thailani and I, you know, when we launched this initiative? Or does it start with them? For thousands of years, wool has been used for carpets. There have been different sheep that have been reared because they are appropriate for the product. It took generations before we figured out what is the right wool. There are tribes called Raikas, Rivaris in India. There are tribes called Bakarwals in Kashmir, whose only job for hundreds of years have been to rear the sheep, shear the wool, and make it an you know, in ingredient for rugs. So do, does it start with them, or does it start with the people who you know, brought it to where it is today? We are like, you know, we, Newton spoke, I stand on giant of, uh, shoulders of giants. You know, we are doing the last mile of, of evolution that has happened for years, which has led to the life that we lead today. After shearing the wool, and I just want to take you through a complicated, elaborate process of even the simple things that you use. This is what we do. We make selections. There are only few wool that can be used for carpets. There are other great wool that cannot be used for carpets. 
like wools that are used for your jacket, for example. You know, many of the wools that are in Australia have long fiber, inappropriate for rugs. Dyeing, wild madder was found to be appropriate for the red color, for which you see a lot of Persian rugs are red. Indigo in India, blue color. You know, replaced later by German chemical dyes. But that was again a process of evolution. Laws, we talked about homo sapiens forming laws. This is an effluent discharge plant to make sure that more of us can live in this planet without killing each other. You know, we make a lot more rugs. You have, you know, technology to make sure that the water that's coming out of the factory can be used in the fields instead of, you know, becoming poisonous and toxic. Weaving. Maybe 500 years that the region of UP has been weaving rugs. Region of Rajasthan, maybe 300 years. Weaving as a, you know, profession has obviously been much, much longer. And this more people work in weaving in any other profession in UP after agriculture. So these are things that have come together to create that simple thing that you work on. Designers, that is the chicken curry motif. You've seen it in clothes. It's probably been invented by Noor Jahan. We used it for rugs. It was part of the Tarun Tehlani uh, collection. The magic of these carpets are in the details. It is not one thing, the operations that go into it, the finance, the IT, the marketing, all businesses need several connected processes. We walk on a millennia of traditions. This is not just with a rug. I just talked about rugs because that's what I know. If you think about your watch, your shirt, everything, think of how it's evolved. And that is what is amazing about the life we lead. Every thoughtless step we take has required generations after generations of people dedicating their life to it to make it more convenient for us. The second business in I am in you know, is tea. I have you know, a little bit of self-promotion talking about Makai Bari tea. It's most expensive tea, first organic product. You know, people recognize it to be a fantastic product. How did it start? Indian tea started with the opium wars. It was too difficult. You know, we, England fought a war, defeated China, got Hong Kong and you know, new territories. But there was, they, had, they realized they had their own colony to grow tea, and they started it in Darjeeling. The first tea factory was Makai Bari. The process of making this you know, simple beverage that all of us have several cups of, there was an opium war, cleared forests, and probably removed plant and animal varieties forever from Duars and Assam, invented clones that are suitable for the Indian climate, brought workers from Chotonagpur because Assam and Duars were at that time forests, there were no human population invented clippers, fast boats that took these teas to England so that they could get the best market. Think of the massive processes, how many people must have been involved and the thought that must have gone in for this simple product to now become, you know, second nature of life. You know, English think there's nothing more English than tea. Indians think there's nothing more Indian than chai. It is foreign to both of us. Hard work from planters, pruners, tasters, packers, with many hazards, uncertainty, to bring a cup of tea for a breakfast. Drink it with sugar? How did that come? Invented in India, and probably Southeast Asia. This history of sugar is you know, part of the history of slavery, and of colonization, of the discovery of America. It was in the ship when Christopher Columbus went to Dominican Republic. In few years after that, within like 15 years after that, slaves moved from Africa to the new world. And it was transplanted in countries which never had sugar. Those countries, you know, if you go to the Caribbean, the reason the Caribbean people are African, Ameri African you know, American are because of the sugar, sugar trade. Today, luckily, sugar is relatively guilt guilt yeah, guiltless, uh, other than it causes obesity. So it's, it's no, longer, no, no longer such a you know, uh, dangerous substance. So it's a giant leap of humanity. Our current condition, our way of living, is built upon such Herculean efforts. There's much to be proud of and some to be ashamed of. What we have achieved as a people is truly amazing. The success isn't merely in terms of comforts and wealth. If someone has been in one of my classes, they would have seen this graph. You know, from around 1500, this is the way the population of the world increased. It's like a straight vertical line, and now it's 
7 billion people. In 1900, the world had 1.6 billion people. In 2014, it held 7.1 billion people. The life expectancy around the world in 1900 was 31. That comes as a surprise to a lot of people, that's because of infant mortality. Not that an average person died at 31, but a lot of infant mortality during that time, which is now 71.5. India has done even better. In 1950, just after we got independence, our longevity was 31, which is now 68 uh, in 2015. A world with many more people living much more longer, requiring much more food, you know, requiring cars, comforts, air conditioners, many more clothes, are living with more comfort, with fewer illness, with less violence than any time in our history. Isn't that amazing? Is it? As a species, our progress has been amazing. There's no question about it. If we weren't humans and we were look at this species, that this is how it would be an epidemic. We would say this is a very dangerous new species that have come into the world. But has progress led to an amazing age? Are moments of our lives better? Are moments of our lives certainly better when we are sick because we have better medicines? When we are hungry because there's more food? When we feel cold or hot because there's better air condition? But when we are not suffering from those issues? On a daily, you know, when you're not subjected to this lecture, when you're sitting outside in the park or something, do you feel your life has become more amazing? Because that is the rub, right? That is what hopefully you will spend most 90% of your life, not in sickness, not feeling uncomfortable, but hopefully you'll be happy when you're not uncomfortable or not sick and you're well fed. Because you better, better do feel happy because as a species, we've killed off all the animals that we don't eat or wear, you know, removed most of the plants that we don't need for food or clothing. And now it's a world that it is to serve the homo sapiens. At least we should feel good about it. We have populated a world where you know, we have very few things remaining which are not of our doing. Is that okay? Now it's up to us to be amazing. The biggest cause of ill health is mental illness. You know, now the software within us have to be studied. And let's make the world amazing and let us sew together. Thank you.